We are so happy that all of you have decided to come and be with us tonight. We have been very much looking forward to this for a long time, and obviously you have too. A lot of you are here from a long way away. We have folks here from Florida, from Tennessee, from North Georgia, from South Georgia. Anybody further than that? We have quite a crowd and we're so happy. By the way, we have a worship service at 10 o'clock, so we'll expect all of you to be back Sunday morning. We like this big crowd. <laughs> we're so happy that you're here. Our order of service tonight will have an opening song, which is number 618. 618 will be our first song. You can follow along in the book or we'll have it on the screen behind me here in just a moment. After that, we'll ask Brother Patrick Gray, the local minister at the Villa Rica congregation, to come and lead us in prayer. And then I'll have some brief introductory remarks about Brother Shane. We will have an invitation after the first lesson. We'll have a 15-minute intermission, and then we'll have a second lesson that Brother Shane will present at that time. So let us all heartily enter into our song service. Brother John McDaniel, one of our deacons here and our associate minister, will lead us in song. If you would, stand for our first song. Thank you, Chris. The invitation song will be number 218, 218. Let's stand as we are standing. Let's sing number 618 on Zion's glorious summit. We will remain standing in reverence for the prayer immediately following this song. And I'm really looking forward to leading this group. So let's all sing out. On Zion's glorious summit, God of hosts, we are indeed humbled at this time as we are mindful of your holiness, 
and our own unworthiness. And Father, we are grateful from the depths of our hearts for the grace that has been poured out upon us abundantly, for the mercy that we have in Christ, for the forgiveness of sins, to know that we can be washed in the blood of the Lamb and to join this heavenly host in singing praise to you, your high and holy name. We're so thankful for this privilege, so thankful for your mercy. Holy Father, we're thankful for this fine assembly tonight and for this grand interest shown in evangelism. We pray, Holy Father, that we will hear something tonight that will ignite a flame in us, an evangelistic zeal, that we can use, Father, to carry the word of the Lord far and wide. But, Father, please help us to be doers of the work and not mere hearers only. So often and we acknowledge this night, Father, our failing. And we seek to do your will. We acknowledge so often what your will is without actually living it. For this we are sorry and we pray, Father, that you help us to live this day forward. True evangelists, seeking the lost, looking for doors of opportunity. Grant to us, Father, those doors of opportunity. Grant to us wisdom and love, and courage, and determination, commitment to your cause. So thankful for all the congregation represented tonight. Pray that you bless us in our efforts in our communities. Help us that we might do those things that will bring glory and honor to your name. Pray for our speaker tonight. Bless the words of his mouth, the meditation of his heart. And may we all be inspired this evening to do better and greater things in your service. We humbly pray and ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Amen. We have our minister to thank, Chad Dalahite, for introducing us to this book, Muscle and a Shovel. He first mentioned it, and we thought, what an odd title. There must be something behind this. And then we read it, and we knew exactly why this was so important. We thought, why don't we just at least try to get Michael Shank to come down and speak to us? And we were very fortunate that he was on his way further south, and uh, he decided to stop by here on his way. So we're so glad that Michael Shank has come to be with us tonight. We're so glad that you have come to be with us tonight as well. I uh, really don't need to introduce him. He's uh, done a lot of uh, descriptions of himself in his book, so you should know him quite well by now. No further ado, Brother Michael Shank. Well, are you happy, happy, happy? <laughs> Y'all look like it. You know, I still cannot get over the fact that you would let a Yankee come down here and preach to you. I thought they're either really loving or they're real desperate. My brother, the brother who said that opening prayer, I'm going to tell you, I rarely begin a lesson with tears. But did that prayer not grab your heart? You see, you can really tell a lot of times when you listen to somebody's prayers and you know when they pray other than when they're up here. And that's a brother right there that spends a lot of time in prayer. Amen? Now see, like he said, I, I, I'm going to do my absolute very best to build a fire tonight. And my fire is small, and I need you to help me build it up. And the way you do that, young boys, uh, do we have some young boys in here tonight? You young boys ever throw gasoline on a fire? It, it's fun, ain't it? <laughs> if I'm preaching truth, you young boys and you men, I want you to amen me. I need your encouragement. I'm not preaching truth. You grab a hold of me and throw me out of here on my ear. Okay, fair enough. 
I'm also going to begin by telling you something. I am absolutely not worthy to be standing here in front of you. You know what? I'm very flawed and I'm weak. And I fall on my face every day and I commit sin. Didn't John say something to that effect in what we call his first letter in chapter 1? Did he not say something to the effect that if we say we have no sin, we we lie and the truth is not in us? Yes? I'm going to tell you, I am not worthy of your accolades. But I'll tell you somebody who is. That is Jesus Christ. God, our Father, receives all credit and all honor and all glory. I need you to understand that tonight before I get started. And I will guarantee you this when I'm done. You're going to find out after I'm done tonight a couple of things. You're going to say, man, if God can use an old dirt bag like that, He can use anybody. And now, come on, brethren, that's supposed to be funny. <laughs> Help me! <laughs> They're a tough crowd, ain't they? <laughs> the second thing that I will tell you when I'm done tonight is, is you're going to say, thank God for that preacher of ours. <laughs> Can I tell you all a couple of stories before I get started? Would that be okay? Hello? Is, it, is this thing working? Uh, how many of you have ever heard of this little town called Saudi Daisy, Tennessee? Hey, there's a lot of you. Yeah. What? Pardon me? Whitwell? I never heard of Whitwell. Whitwell? Whitwell. Am I saying it right? Whitwell. Saudi Daisy, Whitwell. Oh, it's a suburb. <laughs> Brother, I was preaching at Saudi Daisy a few months ago. And a little sweet sister in Christ came up to me when I was done. She said, Mr. Mike. I said, yes, ma'am. She said, you know, uh, she said, I just feel like I know you so good. And I said, thank you. She said, you know how you can read a story and you start reading about people and, and, and you kind of learn things about them? You just know them? I said, well, I, yeah, maybe, kind of, yeah. She said, you know, I could tell as I was reading your story that you was real tall. <laughs> I said, all right. And she said, I could tell that you was real handsome. <laughs> None of one of them made men me on that one, did they? <laughs> my, my chest kind of poked out. I said, yeah. She said, and you know, I just knew from reading your story that you was highly intelligent. I said, keep, keep talking, sister. And she said, sweetheart, now that I've met you in person, I said, yeah. She said, not so much. <laughs> My wife, before I left, we've been married 28 years. I'm going to tell you something, ladies. I, I just... Still crazy about that girl. And uh, she threw her arms around my neck and she squeezed me real tight. Boys and girls, I'm sorry, it's gross. <laughs> and, and she gave me a kiss. And she said, now Michael, let me give you some advice. And now, I, men, how many men listen to their wives? Raise your hand. <laughs> Good job, guys. Just like you, I listened to my wife. She said, I'm going to give you some advice. I said, I'll take it. She said, sweetheart, don't try to be too witty or too charming or too intelligent. She said, just be yourself. <laughs> we like to play pranks on one another. We have, you read the story, you know that. For those of you who have read the story, you know that. A couple of months ago, we had a couple move into a house right up the road from us. We live way out in the country. 
they were moving in, and, and it was on a Saturday afternoon. I was coming around the curve. Me and John Eda was in the car. And I said, honey, look, there, there's that couple. Let me whip in here. I want to meet them. She said, no. She said, look at what I'm wearing. <laughs> I said, honey, you look beautiful. She said, Michael, I don't have a bit of makeup on either. Don't you dare pull in that driveway. I said, you don't have to get out of the car. I said, you just stay here. Just let me run and say hi to him real quick. She said, all right. She said, don't you dare make me get out of this car. <laughs> Walked out across the yard in their mid-30s. A couple of kids running around. Real sweet couple. Introduced myself and I got to talking to him. And the lady, you know, the wife, uh, she starts looking around me. She says, is that your wife out there in the car? I said, yeah. She said, could I meet her? I said, sure. I said, but you have to know something about my wife. I said, now, she's real hard of hearing. She's not. <laughs> she said she is. I said, yes, yeah, real hard to hear. You don't have to talk real loud to her. She said, watch this. She said, honestly, she goes, I knew that real loud. So I go out to the car. And Johnny just give me that evil eye because she knows. She rolls the window down, passed her side. I said, sweetheart, I said, she wants to meet you. She said, I'm going to kill you. I said, just for a second, it's no big deal. You know, she's not dressed up. They're moving in. Don't worry about it. She was so mad. She, she said, I will meet her. She said, don't do this to me again. I said, that's okay, but listen, honey. I said, something you need to know about this lady. I said, she's real hard of hearing. <laughs> now, brother, come on, that's funny. I have not laughed so hard in months. I mean, you ever laugh so hard your stomach hurts? You know, uh, I'm going to answer three questions for you tonight, if I could, with your permission. There are three questions that most folks that read the story have when they're done with the story. People have a lot of questions about it, but they, they have these three primary ones. I've noticed everywhere I go, people ask me these three questions, so I'd like to tell you the questions and see if they're your questions as well, and answer them for you, uh, and ask you, would that be okay with you? Yes? Not, not all of you are smiling, and not all of you are shaking your head yes. Now listen, you're scaring a Yankee to death. <laughs> Is it okay if I share this with you? Okay, thank you. Number one, people say, is Randall still alive? How is he doing today? Where is he at? Isn't that a great question? Randall is very much alive on this side of the grass and doing fantastic. He is living in Nashville, Tennessee. He is an elder in the church now. I can honestly say with all of my heart, he's the finest Christian man that I have ever met in my life. Bar none. He still is. Everything that I tried to describe about him in the story, I did not do it justice. I don't have that much talent. I could not really truly describe to you what a fine, incredible Christian man this man was. Now, he has five children, three boys, two girls. Oldest son is a gospel preacher. Yeah, isn't that? I thought that gets you excited. That excites me. His middle, uh, so see, boy one, gospel preacher. Boy number two is a missionary. Boy number three is studying to be a preacher. Can you believe it? I know, no shock, right? His two daughters still at home. He's doing terrific. Right before I put this book out, he said, Mr. Mike, he's called me Mr. Mike to this day. Still does. Mr. Mike, you're going to make me a promise, young man. I said, what's that? I said, you know I'd do anything for you. He said, you will not tell them my real name. Why not? And that's what I asked him. He said, because. He said, there only needs to be one star in this story. 
And that star is Jesus Christ. And I get emotional when I think about it. Because of His humility and His great love and His true Christian nature. He is so concerned that somebody is going to make Him out to be the star of the story. He said, don't you tell them my real name. You see, I don't know, but for those of you who read the story, and I, spoiler alert, if you haven't read it, you, you just put your fingers over your ears and you go la 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 la. He did not baptize us. See, He wasn't the one at the end of the story that immersed us into Jesus Christ. Did you all notice that? He was out in the audience watching. He would not immerse us for fear that me and John Eda would become like those brothers and sisters in Christ way back there at Corinth in the first century. You know, when some have said, I'm of Apollos, and I'm of Cephas, and I'm of Paul, and we might have said, and we are of Randall. And that's why. That's part of his nature. And I don't mean to disappoint you by not telling you his real name. You have to understand I have given him my word, but I hope you can certainly appreciate the kind of heart that he has. Number two, how in the world did you remember that story with such detail after 20 plus years? You must have some kind of photographic memory. Are y'all having fun? Because I am having a good time. I do not have a photographic memory. I'll tell you how I did it. I wrote it as it happened. Makes sense. You see, here's what I was going to do. Randall starts giving me these Bible verses. And I hear that he's a member of this church and they thought they were the only ones going to heaven. And so, you know what I was going to do? I was going to prove that dude wrong. There ain't no way that guy was right. So he starts quoting the Bible to me, something I had never seen by do. I mean, without the Bible open. It was amazing. And it scared me to death. And so, one night I went home early on. And I got a black spiral bound notebook like you'd take to school with you. You guys probably have a notebook like that. And I started writing everything down in every verse. And then I started writing down what happened at, at times when we talked with one another. And before long, I just started writing this story. And when we were baptized into Christ for the remission of our sins, I wrote on the front of that notebook, and I threw it in an old box marked attic, and I forgot it. And on October 31st, 2008, off the moving truck, I was carrying a big stack of boxes down the ramp. I tripped. And the top box flew off and it hit the concrete garage floor and it popped open and all these files shot across the floor and this spiral notebook shot across the floor. And I start gathering it up, brothers and sisters, and I get over to this spiral book and I picked it up and it said, My Conversion Story, 1988. I thought, I ain't seen that in a long time. And I start flipping through it and I say, hey, I remember that. I'd forgotten about that story. Oh, I'd forgotten he had told me this and that and the other. And I ran to John Nita and I said, Sweetheart, do you remember? Look at this. And we got to reading through it together and we got so excited. And she said, Michael, do you know what you got to do? And I said, What? Because <laughs> you know how smart I am. <laughs> she said, You've got to put that and turn that into a book. I said, ain't no way that's ever going to happen. She said, well, what do you, Michael, that could help people. I said, uh-uh, no way. She said, why would you not put that in a book? I said, two reasons. Number one, number one, John Eda, we're members of the Church of Christ. She was looking at me like you're looking at me right now. She said, so? I said, we don't do testimonials. And all this is is one big old long testimonial. Oh, hello. Anybody home? I said, number two. I said, I would never let my brethren know 
how awful I really was. She said, why? I said, sweetheart, remember the church of Christ. I said, we have to be perfect. We show up on Sunday. We don't sin. Uh-uh, no way. You think I'm going to let them know that I love the Marlboro cigarette? Ain't no way. You think I'm going to let them know how much beer I drank? You think I'm going to let them know how I cursed and I lusted in my heart and I had terrible thoughts and I told lies and did anything I was big enough to do, you actually think I would tell my brethren that because the minute I did, they would all disfellowship me. I said, they'll never let me back in the building. She said, you're serious. I said, I'm dead serious. She said, Mike, I don't think they would treat you that. I said, I know they would. There ain't no way. Uh-uh, no way. I'm never letting that out. So I threw that spiral notebook in a box. Back in that box. No, I didn't throw it in the box that time. No, no, I put it in the... See, I put it on the desk. In the desk drawer. Okay, it ended up in the desk. Early spring of 2011, came across the notebook again. She told me again, turn that into a book. People need that. I said, no way, no how. Had that argument. Two weeks goes by. Listen to me, ladies. Men, I tell you, the value of a good woman, she is priceless. Far greater than gold and diamonds and rubies all put together. Two weeks later, she's standing with her back to me in the kitchen at the coffee pot. She's pouring the coffee. She said, honey. I said, yeah. She turns around. She brought me the cup. And she said, you know, what if one lost person read that story and became a Christian? Did that just not give you goosebumps? I said, you're right. And, and I'll let them withdraw from me if it'll help one person. And so I took that story and put it into the book and put it out. And my brother and sister, I'm telling you this, I said, ain't no way nobody is ever going to buy that book. But maybe if just one person somehow gets a hold of it, Just one good, honest heart. Some old heathen dirtbag like me gets a hold of that story. Maybe somebody like me in this situation. Maybe if they'll read it and just take their Bible and open it. Maybe if they have that good and honest heart described in Luke chapter 8 and verse 15. Maybe they will obey the Gospel of Jesus Christ. Last three months, we've heard of over a thousand baptisms. (laughs) Praise God. Right? Because see, you have to understand, you and I, we are nothing. We are the vessel. We're just old pots. And we ain't special. I'm telling you. Sometimes we get thinking we are. We're not. God can use you. He can take you and He can use you. And He can literally reach the lost through you, through your hands and your feet. Yes? But this brings me to question number three. And there will be a valuable lesson, I think, in this. How did Randall quote the Bible the way he did without that book being open? Has anybody had that question? Nobody? Seriously? Or a couple? Is your backsides getting numb? Do you want me to stop or do you want me to keep going? Okay. I'll keep going then. Right after we were immersed, I went to Randall. I said, brother, I need to know how do you do this. I want to do this like you. I want to be able to know the Bible like you do. And I want to be able to defend this faith the way you do. And I want to do it in love the way you do. How do you do it? He said, Mr. Mike, that's easy. He said, I'll show you. And so he goes over to his briefcase, his old briefcase, and he unsnaps the snaps and he opens it up and he pulls out a stack of three by five index cards. There was a rubber band around this way, and there was a rubber band around this way. And I do not want to exaggerate 
But the best of my knowledge, that stack, from what I remember, now you know fish stories grow over the years, right? So in my mind, that stack was about this tall. But in reality, it, it seems like it was about, you know, about that thick. There was a whole bunch of cards there in that stack. And he popped the rubber bands off of them, and he took one card off and he handed it to me, and I took it and I looked at it, and brother and sister, you know what that card had on it? One, yeah, amen. One Bible verse that he had written by hand. One per card. One Bible verse, one card. And I looked at that. And I said, let me see that stack. And I took the stack. And the stack, you could tell it had coffee spilled all over it. The corners were all chewed up like a dog had gotten a hold of it. You know, they were so worn out, some of them were torn almost in half. There was crispy cream glaze all over it. <laughs> now that's good stuff. Makes you want donuts, doesn't it? And I looked, and there's one Bible verse. And one Bible verse. And one Bible verse. And I kept going through. And on every single card, there was one Bible verse per card in his handwriting. I said, tell me. He said, Mr. Mike. He said, how many weeks are in a year? And in my Yankee math, I said, 52. Did that not impress you? <laughs> this is really a tough audience, brother. <laughs> I'm going to pray your preacher gets a raise. <laughs> <laughs> How many weeks in a year, Mr. Mike? 52. He said, that is right, my brother. Take two weeks off. I said, 50 weeks in a year. He said, that is correct. He said, here's what you do, Mr. Mike. You take one card. He said, oh, what I want you to do is go down here to the office supply house and buy you a couple of stacks of these 3 by 5 index cards. And boys and girls, what you do is you go to your Bible and you find all of the verses you want to memorize. He said, you find verses number one on your faith and on how to become a Christian. And then he said, number two, on about the church that Jesus purchased with His precious blood, Acts 20 and 28. The church that we're added to by God, not by us voting somebody in or us joining the church of our choice, but Acts 2.47, when we are obedient to Peter's divinely inspired instructions on how to become in a saved state. Who adds us to the church? God adds us, see, to this blood-bought institution, Christ's body. Paul said, of which there is one of. Ephesians 4.4. 4. And he said, you write all these down, just one verse per card. Now, boys and girls, if you forget everything I tell you tonight, that's okay. It hurt my feelings, but that's okay. But don't forget this part, okay? Don't forget this part. Most, listen, if, if we shut it off right now and I left and all of us went home and we turned our TV sets on, most important thing tonight is this, what I'm telling you right now. He said, you take that one card, you write all those verses down. And you put that stack somewhere where you can get it. But you take one card with you and one card only and you put it in your pocket. And he said, and then, Mr. Mike, when you go to bed at night and you flip on Johnny Carson, you pull that card out and you read it. You put it back. He said, when you get up in the morning and you're out there having your Marlboro. Boy, you think just because it got wet, all of a sudden I was perfect? <laughs> Them things were hard to give up. He said, when you're out there having your marble, he said, I know you're going to give them up, brother. But he said, in the meantime, while you're out there like an idiot, read that card. He said, Mr. Mike, when you're in your car and you're going through traffic, when you hit a red light, he said, pull that card out and read it. I said, I can't do that. He said, why not? I said, well, because people, it light turns green, I won't know. He said, brother, people are going to love you so much, he said, they will help you when the light turns green. <laughs> I said, well, I tried, they will. <laughs> and you know what? I realized something. I realized that Randall was a man that had sacrificed. See, he was a man that picked up his cross. Oh, we read that verse and we talk about it, and oh, it sounds good. But he sacrificed his life for the Master. 
He gave up a lot of things in His life to put His focus where? He worked at it. You see, sometimes we think the only way to spell faith is F-A-I-T-H. And that is not true. Sometimes you and I spell faith O-B-E-Y. Sometimes we spell faith, listen to this, this is a curse word. Are y'all ready? W-O-R-K. Amen. Thank you. We spell our faith. Sometimes we spell our faith L O V E. Yes? There's lots of ways that you and I have to spell our faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. But let me tell you something, brethren. Nothing has been more important to me than that lesson that he taught me right then, there, and that day. Because. Mr. Mike, if you will take one Bible verse, one card, one week, every single week, at the end of the year you take a two-week vacation from your Bible, how many verses will you know by heart? Listen to this. I said 50. He said, Woo! Amen! He said, Mr. Mike, do it two years. He said, then you'll know how many. How many, brother? Hundred. He said, Mr. Mike, when you know 100 Bible verses top of your, out of your mind and heart, he said, you're going to know more Bible than almost anybody running around Nashville, Tennessee calling themselves Christian. And I said, wow. He said, now wait a minute, do it three years. Then you'll know how many. I said 150. He said, when you know 150 Bible verses from your heart and from your mind, you are going to know more Bible than 99% of the pastors running around Nashville, Tennessee. And I said, wow. Now that got me excited. Because you see, I knew I wasn't the smartest guy in the room. But I knew this. I could memorize one card in a week. John 11.35, would you all say that? Wow, that was good. I wanted you to say John 11, 35. They said Jesus wept. You brother know your Bibles down here. Okay, say John eleven thirty five. 35. Jesus wept. Thank you. John eleven thirty five. 35. Jesus wept. John eleven thirty five. 35. Jesus wept. You just did your first card. Hello? Amen. Thank you, young man. That's encouraging a gospel preacher. Now let me ask you all something. When a man speaks, if any man speaks, let him speak as of the... of God. First Peter chapter... Amen. And verse 11. This Bible... I get tired of... Hey, it's almost a quarter after seven. I need to shut it off, don't I? Okay. I'm sorry. Please forgive me. I get to talking, and I don't look at the clock, and like an idiot, I just keep going and going and going. Let me... Can, can I have five minutes of your time, and I will shut it off, and we'll take a break. I get so tired of hearing in political conversations today about how the Constitution is a living, breathing document because it is not. I get so tired of hearing that, I could pull my hair out what little I have left. My joke's getting no better. Somebody's got to work on their timing because that timing was bad. That was bad. That Bible, that's the only living and breathing document that's ever existed. It's the only living and breathing document that ever will exist. Let me tell you something about this book that you already know. That book by that Hebrew writer in that fourth chapter. He said this right here, it is quick and it's powerful and it's sharper than any two-edged piercing even to the dividing asunder 
of soul and spirit. God bless you. Do you know any technology that's ever existed throughout time that can split a soul from a spirit? This is the only thing that can do that. There's nothing else. Mankind has never developed anything that can split soul and spirit. What else did the Hebrew writer say that it did? Joints and marrow. Thank you, brother. It will cut open joints and marrow. M marrow is inside the what? This Bible will cut you through the bone. And then what else? It, it's a discerner of the thoughts and intents. It's an amazing thing. And here is the problem today. In our brotherhood today, something's happened. We used to be called the people of the book up until in the 1960s and something happened. Now, I don't, I'm not smart enough to know what it was. But I know up until that time, there wasn't Mr. Google. Right? We were called people of the book. They didn't call us Church of Christers. They called us people of the book, the Bible. Why? Well, because if you wasn't a member of the Church of Christ, you want to know something about this book and where to find it, you would go, hey, isn't Uncle Sally's first cousin's nephew, sister's plumber's brother a member of the church? Christ? Yeah, give him a call. He's going to know where that's at. Right? Okay, that's how we were known. All the way up to the 60s. Now, something happened till we were no longer called that 70s, 80s, 1990s, year 2000. Young people today, here we are, and we find our brotherhood as a whole. I'm not pointing a finger at you because i got three coming back at me. I'm not criticizing you, sister or brother. I'm saying as a whole. Are you all with me? The brotherhood as a whole, we've gotten so dumb of our Bible that we could not beat ourselves out of a wet paper bag with our knowledge of it. We have forgotten this book. And then what happens there is when we forget God's Word because we haven't had the faith to W-O-R-K with it and focus on it, we get out in the world and somebody comes along and they go, hey man, ain't you remember that church? Crazy people, uh, ain't got no piano and organ? And he's like, uh, yeah. <laughs> well, why don't you people have a piano and organ? You know that David used harps. You know it's in the Old Testament. You know there's going to be harps in heaven. Well, you people are so crazy you don't even use pianos and organs. What's the matter with you? And you see, when you and I don't know this book, here's what happens. Watch this. Uh, well, there, there's a couple of verses in it. Uh, I can show you sometime. Uh, yeah. And you see, when we don't know this book, what that does, it creates fear in our minds and in our hearts. And all of a sudden, what happens is, hey man, you remember... You remember that crazy church that doesn't have a piano and organ? And, and he goes, uh, uh, yeah. Uh, well, how come? Well, I, I got a really smart preacher. Let me get him. He'll tell you. Hello? And unfortunately, that's what's happened to us today. Let me ask you one question with a close. Uh, would you agree that we are in desperate need of a second restoration movement? We need it desperately. We need it. See, I didn't come down here tonight to sell you a book. Doesn't that surprise you? I did not come here to sell you a book. I came down here to provoke you unto love and to what? Because I love you. If you use the book, great. If you use an open Bible, wonderful. If you use Jewel Miller film strips, fantastic, right on. If you use the open Bible study series, fantastic. Whatever you use, brothers and sisters in Christ, it's time. And if you're not a Christian tonight, you need to be a Christian. Because outside of Jesus Christ, there's no spiritual blessings. And you see, one of those spiritual blessings is the forgiveness of sins. And Paul said in Ephesians chapter 1 and verse 3, he said that all spiritual blessings are found where? In Christ. That very same Paul tells you how to get into Jesus Christ in the third chapter of the book of Galatians. He said, as many of you as have been baptized into Christ have put on Christ. If, you're, you, if you've never put Him on, 
in the watery grave of baptism for the remission of your sins. You ain't in Christ. You better get in Him. Because He's coming back. 2 Thessalonians chapter 1. He is coming back with a vengeance with His angels in flaming fire. And He's going to seek vengeance on those, the Bible says, who know not God and who obey not the Gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ. If you need to respond, do it right now as together we stand and sing. take about a 15 minute intermission it's uh, 20 after 7 right now we'll reconvene in 15 minutes be 25 of we have some bathroom facilities in the lobby and there's a water fountain out there if you have that need so you are dismissed for 15 minutes we'll reconvene in just a few moments <laughs>